sessions for the Creative Freedom Summit, and it's my honor to introduce Pat. Uh, Pat, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just tickled pink to be here today to talk about uh, this topic. And um, there are a, um, a couple of small things. If you are joining in on the um, on the live stream, and you're taking a look at this now, or you're in the matrix chat room, there should be a URL uh, for a slides.com link. Um, it's a hosted reveal.js slide deck. Um, I, I'll, I control the advancement of the slides, but it, it's a web page where you'll actually get the full slide deck, um, and you can see it as I as I talk through it and move through it. And I'm also going to share here um, on the live stream so that we have it for posterity's sake. Uh, let's share a screen. As I was saying, if you happen to be watching this um, on the live stream and you haven't gone to the actual slides.com deck yet, this is a quick QR code that will lead you to the slide deck as I'm preparing it and moving through it. Uh, and then we'll talk later about the dangers of scanning random QR codes that everyone tells you might be okay. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Pat David. Um, you may have found me at uh, patdavid.net, and you may know me from uh, a few different places like uh, the GIMP team and GIMP.org or possibly even uh, pixels.us or pixels.us, um, where we um, have done all kinds of cool things. I'll talk about the GIMP in just a moment, but a uh, real quick plug for pixels.us that kind of leverages what we're going to talk about in this presentation is uh, pixels.us is a community that I created, I guess, eight years ago now, um, really focused on kind of consolidating all of the people that like to do and practice photography in general. And it was interesting because we had a lot of people that were working in photography, but they were kind of stovepiped into different communities. There were people that talked about the GIMP, people talking about dark table, people talking about raw therapy, astrophotographers in very specific places. And what happened was all the free software using photographers were spread all over the place uh, when they didn't need to be. And I said, well, look, we're all doing photography of some sort and we're focusing on doing it with free software. So maybe we could get a community together where we could do that. And that was really kind of the... Um, the crux for creating uh, a place like pixels.us highly recommend you visit if you have any photography questions um at all concerning um uh, concerning free software or you may know me from tossing my children around in the house uh, while i was testing out cameras wherever you might happen to know me from that's who i am but uh that's secondary to the fact that we want to talk today about the uh, GNU image manipulation program. Uh, I've been a member of the GIMP project for a long time now, not as long as some of the folks that are there. But if you're not familiar with the GIMP, I'm curious to know what color rock it is you've been living under for the last 27 years. Uh, it is a cross-platform image editing uh, software, and it's been available across all major OSs for a long time. We're actually celebrating uh, the 27th um, year of GIMP as a project this year. So we're closing in on the big 3.0, which should be fun. And for those of you that have never actually seen any of the GIMP people, these are a series of headshots that I took of the team at a uh, Libre Graphics meeting maybe eight years ago now at this point. But they're uh, a fantastic group of folks and a goofy bunch of people to hang around who are all uh, incredibly big hearted and uh, very generous with their time. So just a kudos to the team in case they see this later on or they happen to be around. But when we talk about photography with GIMP, there's a couple of things lately that are um, slightly different that you kind of want to um, be aware of these days. And these days, a lot of folks are generally probably going to be using some sort of a raw um, image file format out of their camera. And really, RAWs are just kind of unprocessed image data that we get directly from the camera sensor. And we have specialized tools for developing images from these raw files that are kind of focused on uh, some some higher level uh, image manipulation, some demosaicing and some other things. And if you don't know what all those are, it's okay, you don't have to. But just be aware that if you, when you start to get a little bit more into photography as a hobby or, or as a profession even, uh, you're going to be dealing with raw files. And the methods that you approach processing images in a raw editor are going to be a little bit different than what we're going to see here uh, today that you would do with the raster editor <clears throat> in GIMP. The other thing I want to talk about too was a project from a good friend of mine, um, uh, David Schumperle, uh, and that's a uh, gimmick, which is Gracie's uh, Magic for Image Computing. It's available as a plugin for uh, GIMP and Krita, 
And really, it's a collection of advanced image processing filters that were have been written by by David himself and by other people in the community for doing various types of processing of images. I actually use it extensively for a handful of um, very specific um, <clears throat> image processing algorithms that get helpful in certain cases. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Fabulous project, highly recommended. Can't say enough good things about it. So as an overview of what I want to try to get through today, and by the way, it's really tough. Like uh, Maureen was said, well, can you talk about photography with GIMP at the Creative Freedom Summit? Yes, I would love to. And uh, I can talk for as long or as little as you want. And then I realized I probably shouldn't have said as little because, you know, the, the overall topic of photography is huge in the first place. And then <clears throat> how to approach editing and doing things with it um, is just a, a, a large domain. So I'm trying my best to kind of skim the top of uh, where the current state of some fun tools are for doing image processing and GIMP is. Believe me that there are a lot more details that are involved and I can't recommend enough for you to either reach out to me personally, check out the GIMP IRC channel or come on over to the pixels.us uh, community and ask some questions there. Uh, you're never gonna ask a dumb question as far as we're concerned and we're happy to guide you to the right place because I've written extensively on a lot of these topics. But today we're gonna talk about um, some composition cropping and guides and those tools in GIMP. Contrast details and noise, a very common thing that most people have to deal with photographs. Some black and white image processing because it's fun. And then colors, tones, and, and color tone matching, uh, which is uh, what most people are probably going to want to play with um, in GIMP as well. So when we talk about something like composition, really this is a ranging of a visual elements within a frame. When you are um, talking about uh, dealing with it in GIMP, though, or even any other image processing, really it's about removing and focusing on elements within a frame. And I say removing and focusing on elements within a frame because chances are you might not get a second chance to grab a photograph, meaning that the image that you're looking at is the image you have to deal with, and you might not ever get a chance to go back in time to try to capture that same image um, again. So with what you have, you want to try to work within it. And so in GIMP, at least in my personal workflow, I'm a big fan of just using a selection tool and then cropping and editing and doing some other things with it as well. And this is just the rectangle select tool in GIMP. Um, I, I, this is such a fundamental tool that almost seems silly to talk about it. But a lot of folks never really pay much attention to the tool options. And this is kind of a general thing uh, in GIMP as overall. There are multiple options available for each tool that you might use. And if you don't use GIMP often, you might overlook them and not realize the power that's available to you. In the case of doing cropping and composition work, I find that having an aspect ratio and being able to put in exactly what it is is very handy. Sometimes I want a 2.35 to 1, like a cinema aspect ratio. I want a 4 by 3. I want a 1.85 by 1 for like a less widescreen um, uh, image um, or a 1 to 1 if I just want a square image. And then the highlight, which allow, you'll see that in just a moment, which allows you to kind of highlight the areas that you have selected at the rectangle select. Uh, you can change that opacity. And then guidelines, rules of thirds, rules of fifths, diagonals, um, and all those other fun um, kind of guides you might have. So uh, this is my daughter uh, in upstate New York at a wedding, being a farmer, I think she must be, because she's wearing overalls and a flannel shirt, or, that or, or the coolest hipster kid I've ever seen. But, you know, when you look at a photograph like this, what you have when you uh, enable those tool options for rectangle select is you will, you can see here, the uh, areas that have been selected are highlighted, the rest of them are darker. And then you've got these, these guides that will um, automatically scale around with the selection for you to allow you to, um, to compose the photo. And of course, you know, general rules of thumb tend to be, you know, you kind of want to visually focus um, a, uh, the, uh, the image in some way at possibly a, a guideline or a um, combination of guidelines. So for example, if I were looking at rules of thirds, that I know that I wanted to focus on my daughter's face. These are kind of the four options that are available to me if I put the intersection of thirds lines uh, right in the middle of her face along her eye line. And if you see that visually, there's um, you know a couple that stand out as usable and a couple that are just goofy looking. And you know of the ones that I do like, you know I kind of get some general options that are laying out there. I end up with some some interesting. Um, an interesting result and you know now what happens is compared to the original image i think that this really helps to um provide a lot more a dynamic view of the um of the image for example if my focal area is here on her and i've moved the thirds line along here 
I, I can clearly see that my focus is here, but there are a couple of real strong visual elements in this image. You know, uh, the, the bench nearby leading to a tree in the background and the tent whose strong lines lead me right back to her face again. There's an interesting bit here. And so it's really about, you know, kind of leading those viewers eyes on a journey within a frame. Now, granted, you might not even be considering that when you press the shutter yet. And if there's anything I've learned about photography, it is slowly peeling back an onion of skills that you slowly build up over time. Any one of us can just press a, a shutter button. It's the true greats that can pre-visualize and be ready for an amazing shot long ahead of it ever happening. And these are things that you, you only pick up through repetition uh, and practice of the craft constantly. But, you know, you can see from the uh, original image on the top here to the one on the bottom, I feel like I've gotten a more interesting photo um, overall, right? There's a couple of distracting elements, like the, since your eyes are naturally drawn to the brighter area of the frame, uh, the, the peaking uh, sun in the top right corner of the frame, it's a little bit overwhelming and it kind of draws attention away from my subject, which happened to be my daughter. So um, it's, it, it's a powerful tool. There's all kinds of ways to play with cropping and composition, obviously. Um, and I recommend playing a lot. I, I find myself enjoying it quite a bit, trying all different kinds of weird and extreme crops just to see if it'll prov provide uh, a more interesting view of an image for me. So uh, contrast details and noise is uh, another bit of just a fundamental topic that the tools haven't really changed much. But if you're not accustomed to having played with them before, I just want to show them very quickly. Um, and, you know, a contrast is really just a range of brightness across an image. And there's two primary tools that you can play with to do this in an image. And get one of them is an actual brightness and contrast um, uh, tool. The other one is to actually adjust the color curves. And I'd say for probably most things you might do in photography uh, in GIMP, you're going to be playing in color curves a lot. And it, it would behoove you to learn them and understand what they're doing. And as a matter of I'll I'll come back to my thought there. So... Taking again uh, another look at the same image, for instance, you can see here uh, that my histogram of the image on the right, and if you haven't seen a histogram before, this is basically just how many values of that level of black or white or in between are um, in the image overall. And it kind of gives me a feel for what my overall image is doing. That is to say, the way that the image sits right now, I can see that um, I have a lot, of, a lot of darker colored pixels in the image, um, and they kind of taper up to white and slowly taper off. Um, as you get to the to the pure white tones. And you'll also notice, <clears throat> for example, I actually don't have anything way down here in pure black. So that gives me a rough idea of what's happening. But now what happens is when I apply any of these contrast tools, um, in the top example, I have cranked the contrast with the contrast and brightness tool down to negative 20. And you can kind of see that result. And then in the bottom one, we push it up to plus 20. And you can see the corresponding histogram as well. When you decrease the, um, the contrast in an image, you're going to start compressing that histogram. You're going to start pushing all of those pixels in your image and start squishing them into the middle. And <coughs> excuse me, when you increase the contrast, you do the opposite. And you start pushing them out to the sides. And they kind of start going, your, your pixel levels start kind of pushing out to the extremes more and more. Um, and, you know, it, it, what you want most likely is some level of reasonable increase in the contrast because, again, it tends to be a little bit more pleasing to the eye. It's the thing you're going to get to from playing a lot, and you'll find whether or not it gets to where you want it to be. And honestly, if you take anything else away from this entire presentation, I just want you to take away that this view of the curves basically tells you that that line that you're going to adjust in the left of your darks and the right of your lights and the mids of your mids, um, and that is the region of the image that you're going to be affecting when you play with anything in the um, color curves. For example, if I only take the values and I drag down here um, just a tiny bit, what I'm really doing here is I'm just kind of crushing those blacks just a tiny bit, and I'm pushing those whites up in the, in the um, lower mids and then on up. And it adds just a tiny bit of contrast to the overall image, right? The top one uh, is the original, and the bottom one is the application of that slight S-curve. So, um, so it's a tool to learn, tool to have fun with. I'm going to revisit it again in just a few minutes. 
in terms of details, honestly, it's one of those things where you're not. I got. I got. I don't really have a whole lot of new to offer uh, in general, right? There's an unsharp mask, wavelets, FFT sharpening. These are just ways to sharpen the image, basically increase the contrast on a very fine scale between pixels that are right next to each other. Uh, if there's a bit of a color difference, and it's one of those cases where, and I think we talked about this briefly yesterday with Ryan Gourley, is that um, you know using free software proprietary tools for the most part the Fundamental algorithms underneath the application of these kinds of filters and functions are the same no matter what tool you're using. It might be in a different place, but under fundamentally they work the same. Learning what they are, how they work fundamentally, means that you can transfer that application of knowledge to any other software for the most part. An unsharp mask is most likely an unsharp mask no matter where you go. And as far as noise goes, I just embrace it. If you have to, Gamic has some amazing filters for denoising an image. But I don't often denoise an image personally. For my, in general, I will let the, uh, let, the let the noise lie where it where it shows up. For example, so um, so in like the context of things like uh, colors in black and white, doing black and white photography, which is ton of fun. I like to say colors is so cliche, but all the new kids are doing is not very interesting. But taking an image like we see here, which was shot on a gray foggy day, and it's in color. That and I don't know if you can tell it from the stream, but this is color. Um, it's visually uninteresting from a color perspective. That is to say, color doesn't add anything to the image, in which case I begin to want to focus on form and tone instead. And it's kind of a nice path on the photographic journey to learn from, where you can focus on just the forms and you can focus on just the tones in your image and not what the various colors might be doing to help you have a better understanding of composition and how those forms affect uh, how your image might be viewed. And honestly, again, this is another case where there's too many ways to list uh, for getting to a black and white image very quickly in GIMP. Uh, there's, uh, you know, desaturate, color to gray, channel decomposition. Luminosity and color to gray both mimic human perception in terms of turning uh, color pixels into uh, gray values. Um, you know, so I generally will start with some sort of a luminance desaturation just to see how things will look, for example. And what you see here, for instance, is a, um, a hue shift from blue to blue going from 0 to 360 degrees with a, um, a gradient from transparent to full black on the bottom. And you can see that illuminance desaturation will favor the yellows, the greens, uh, and the cyans because those colors will be perceived as brighter than others, even though they might have the same uh, relative brightness value from RGB. So, you know, you put it together. You take an image, desaturate it, turn it into... Um, add some contrast curve like we just saw a minute ago color to gray and you get an image that i think personally pops a little bit more than uh than just having the uh the plain color image the way that it's set so that's just me and then of course if you're into color and you like that like all the cool kids do it's interesting to note at least in gimp that as far as colors are concerned these are still just channels in your image the red green and blue pixel channels in your image and you can modify each of those red greens and blues and their corresponding curves separately from each other, which will have a wild different types of effects depending on what you end up doing. But small, careful shifts of various sorts can produce some uh, subtle and very pretty, in my opinion, differences in the image that provide a wonderful color toning. This is a personal, um, a personal process that finds something that you rather enjoy. This is kind of a portrait-esque curve that I've been using since the dawn of time that I like because I think the skin tones are a lot better uh, they roll off a little bit nicer. There's some nice color in those skin tones, um, for example, with those. And what happens is when you do this over and over again, you end up making lots and lots of uh, different types of uh, color emulations. And so much so that I think I went off the deep end a few years back and we ended up producing, I don't know, a few hundred. And then other people started kind of jumping on and making some as well. And they made some more and added to it. And now we've ended up with, I don't know, somewhere in the order of 600 plus kind of these film emulations that are available in free software, uh, Gamic, Raw Therapy. Uh, my friend Jonas Wagner has a um, film emulator online that you can apply these filter or these uh, color effects to. But they're all generally predicated on making modifications in the value or the red, green, and blue pixels and what those curves should look like. That's the same image just with different colors applied to it, for example. So uh, check it out because it'll, it's a big time saver. If you're just looking to grab a photo, crop it nicely, add some pretty color curves to it, and get a workflow done so you can get on to doing other things that you might need to do, great. If you're really into the photography and want to know how those color curves work, it's a slightly different problem, but 
you can uh, you can spend all the time in the world getting into it. And I'm happy to help if you want to reach out to me on the on the forum. And then finally, I think, you know, looking at something like masking, I actually went to go look for an old photo of mine that was out there somewhere. And I, I accidentally typed Pat David Gimp mask into Google. It was not what I expected it to be. So maybe don't do that. Maybe just Pat David mask or photography or something. It's definitely going to less embarrassment. So masking is basically just a process of applying a mask to an image. And when you apply a mask to a layer, all you're really doing is giving a black to white or some variation in between um, uh, uh, values to the layer that says any values that are all black or all the way transparent to all the way translucent um, from black to white. And that's simple. I think everybody probably gets the general idea of a mask. But the power of a mask is when you use copies of the actual image itself to build the masks from, right? So usually we call these luminosity masks and they're a lot of fun. It's, it's an opportunity to target different effects to very specific regions within an image. For instance, that first image on the left um, was taken at a beer fest years ago here in Mobile, Alabama. On the right is the inverse of that image. Um, if I use that uh, image as a mask and take my darks and tone the, the photo very blue and take the lights and tone them very orange and then apply those masks, you end up with this kind of very cool, you know, it's a, a classic split tone, um, split tone effect that you see here where the highlights will tend to have an orange cast to them and any of the darker shadows will tend to have a, um, tend to have kind of a bluish cyan cast and then skin tone, the lighter tones end up being kind of orangey colored. It's a classic split tone and it's a good base for playing out, playing with these uh, to know how to use them. So classic split toning, a lot of fun. Uh, and then coming up near the end here, basically my best piece of advice is try out a handful of these classic um, uh, classic uh, toys, uh, classic functions and filters for modifying an image, throw them all together in various ways and uh, experiment. You know, like the image that we see here, for instance, um, of my friend Myrie, th that's the original straight out of camera JPEG on the left. Uh, that's the retouch photo on the right. They are um, using, I didn't use anything in this image that was any different than anything I just showed you at a high level right now. Maybe a little bit more in depth, but that was basically it. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, and, you know, some general resources. Uh, obviously, GIMP.org, come to the site, support us, check it out. I've written a ton, a ton. I have written a ton, either on my personal website at patdavid.net, um, or I translated some of those tutorials onto uh, GIMP.org, but there's a ton of stuff there. Gamic is well worth your time to check out and put into um, uh, uh, Krita or GIMP, whichever. And then, of course, come to pixels.us if you're into photography at all. So that is me. That's my email. That's my URL. That's my Wilbur mascot. And that's my wife in the photograph. Thank you very much. Hey, Pat. Hi. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation. We did have some questions coming in, but okay. uh, you were in such a flow that I decided to just wait until the end here to jump into those. So here we go. Uh, you mentioned the Libre Graphics meeting. Is that yep. still going on? And where can we find information about that event? Uh, those are wonderful questions. The last emails I saw that went to the uh, the mailing list for Libra Graphics meeting, I think, went unanswered. The intention was to have one again, but I don't think we've built up any impetus to make that a reality yet. That's okay. the I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Cousin. <laughs> so it's a question mark for now. Yes, that's right. Hopefully soon we'll find something. Yeah. Cool. So I guess uh, the LPM did not go virtual. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So next question, what camera or cameras do you use and what model would you recommend for a photography newbie? Uh, that's a great question. So my camera lately has been an Olympus OMD, which is a micro four thirds uh, mirrorless interchangeable lens camera. You know, uh, you know what they look like. I think that, um, it's a cheap, small, uh, relatively inexpensive, small-ish camera system that's super lightweight. I could take it with me everywhere. Um, I try to avoid getting gear acquisition syndrome too much because I, it can spiral out of control real fast. Depending on what your budget was like, there's a couple of different options. But um, I know a lot of my friends have been loving Fuji 
and Fuji's cameras lately, just the color renditions, the glass has been fantastic. Um, so one of the Fuji's might be a fun camera to get into if you had a price range that fit that. So what photo management tools do you use and what features do you like or don't like about it? Sure. Okay. So I, I didn't get a chance to mention all of the projects again, because I wanted to focus on GIMP. Um, I think Digicam is a fantastic uh, asset management system for photography in general. Uh, so uh, Digicam, I'm going to put it in the chat. Digicam is fantastic. Um, if not, I can often just use my file system. I have a rough idea about where my photos are because I arrange them by year and month and an event. So I kind of have a rough idea where things might be. Um, and then from there, if I'm using dark table, I'll just use dark table as a, uh, you know, the light table where I can, I'm sorry, the catalog where I can look through it. And the same thing with raw therapy, where I'll load up a folder um, and then quickly be able to sort through the images in a, in a file viewer from there and then jump directly to my raw processing. Cool. All right. Next question. What is the mosaicing and oh, how sure. does it yeah. to raw photo editing. Sure, I got you. All right, so if you, real quick and easy is, um, if you picture a sensor on a camera, the sensor does not have photo sites where uh, photons can hit the sensor that record all uh, spectrum wave, wave, wavelengths of light at once. Rather, they have uh, a site for red, a site for green, and a site for blue. And, you know, when the wavelengths for blue hit the blue guy, he registers some value. And you have millions of those all across your sensor that will create your final image. Well, the problem is a pixel is represented as a red, green, blue combination on your in, on your on your monitor, but on the photo sites from a camera, they're not. A site is red, green, blue. It's like a pixel is red, a pixel is green, a pixel is blue right next to each other. Well, to recreate an RGB pixel image, we have to smush all those RGB colors together from each of the photo sites. That's demosaicing, right? To, so to get one pixel color of red, green, and blue, I have to actually take three different values and kind of push them back together. Um, and we have a great, we have a, we actually have a wonderful image on an article on the Pixels website when we were talking about um, doing something called pixel shift with pen, with Pentax cameras from a man, uh, one of the users called Heckfloss. And if I can find it real quick, I'll put it in, a link to it. But uh, basically. It's taking the sensor image and cr getting pixel data back out of it rather than just individual uh, wavelength data. Got it. <sighs> Sorry. Trying to take some notes as I, I go. I felt like that was wordy. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, okay, last question. What sure. was the technique used to key out the door frame in one of the last images with the girl with the long hair and beanie? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, no, it, uh, it was... Um, a lot of patience um yeah like it like what happened was i'd taken this shot and i said son of a gun the door frames in there which meant that i had to go through step by step and basically clone and color match other sections of the wall nearby and put it over the door frame the actual tutorial that this image is included in is available from here which was 10 years ago now so it um i think i might have mentioned the actual step-by-step -step in that tutorial I just linked right there. Matter of fact, yes, I'm pretty sure that I did. But yeah, so it was um, basically take the image, duplicate it, shift the top layer over to fill out the left side a little bit, and then uh, use a layer mask to paint in the, the same wall and then color match it a little bit on that side and then kind of finagle it again. The step-by-steps are in that link, um, so you can see it. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to put oh, yeah. in the notes yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, I can't recommend enough, like hitting those URLs or even going to my webpage, because um, I've written about all of these topics in, in mind-numbing detail in some cases. Like the digital black and white tutorial on GIMP is adapted from like a five-post um, uh, uh, tutorial that where each post was, I don't know, a thousand words at least. It was an obnoxious amount of, of writing. But if you have any questions, those things haven't changed. They're still very valid in GIMP right now because, again, the tools that underlie everything haven't really made a big change. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You fit a lot of information into a small amount of time. And I feel like uh, the next summit we have, uh, we might need to have you you know, come on for a bit longer and show us more stuff. Yeah, like the problem is you give me an hour and it's going to, like this already took me a week and a half or two weeks of playing with it to finally get a presentation. Going. And by the way, finally, one last quick thing. I just wanted to, to say while I have a stage and a microphone for just two seconds. Um, sure. 
Yeah, what the, the reason that I did all of the things that I've done so far and the reason I'm working so heavily mm -hmm. in free and open source software is very similar to Ryan Gorley's reason. If anyone was able to visit that presentation yesterday, somewhere there's a kid that doesn't have money like I did growing up or access to a lot of tools that might get a secondhand digital camera and have a little bit of fun with it. I want to make sure that that kid has access to tools that will let them uh, spread their creative wings and really learn to play with things without having to incur cost, um, both uh, as in beer or as in um, uh, freedom. So awesome. yeah, pay it forward. Okay, thank you guys so much for having me. Looking forward to the next one. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Pat.